Nakgane, Tales of the Northern Sasquatch. Presentations by author Red Grossinger and forward writer Raymond Yakalaya. The book presents over 80 encounters with Nakane, giant bipedal forest-dwelling entities, also known as Sasquatch. The Dene of the Northwest Territory is called uh, the Sasquatch Nakani, and that means the Bushman. And we've known about this creature for a long time. I would say thousands of years, maybe even from the time that it, we came, it came across and we came across from Siberia on the land bridge. So let's say 25,000 years, that's probably a good estimate. But for some unknown reason, this creature has really mysterious powers. It seemed to be uh, amongst our elders taboo for them to talk to them about us, to talk to uh, them about the creature, the, the Nakani. And uh, so it's now uh, a time where we're saying to our elders, so we're not, you can warn us about it, they'll warn us, they'll say, Raymond, be careful, Nakani is out there. We know that. Tell us what are we supposed to do to save ourselves. My dad's sister was taken in a bush camp. It was called Willow Lake, very close to my hometown of Tulita. One elder, uh, Grandpa Etze, Etze Bernard chased uh, the uh, Nakani, who would grab my aunt. She was about 11, 12. She was screaming her head off. It was a uh, fall bush camp, and he chased her for about 20, 25 minutes and he dropped her and he picked her up. My grandpa, it's, uh, grandpa Bernard picked her up and brought her back. Now when that happens, our people always say the, the person who is taken or stolen does not live long. It says the, the translation of the experience in our language from Dene language to the English language, you say it frightens the heart. The other story that I can share with my younger brother. Dwayne was in the mountains hunting moose this time of the year on the Keel River. And him and his best friend, he was eight, his best friend Peter, Andrew was 10. They were, uh, we were, they were hunting down on the, on the Keel River and they uh, were drifting down uh, on the, by the motors and uh, my mother and stepfather were in front of the boat and uh, the Nakani, the Bushman, the Sasquatch was sleeping behind a log and I guess it smelt them, I think. Something heard a noise and we had got up and my brother is here and about 20 feet away on the shore, the Sasquatch had stood up and it looked at my brother and Peter in the eye and now my mother is this way and they're looking at it at each other in the eye. And my brother said to me, he said, Raymond, we were looking at each other in the eye. I said, what did you see? He said, Raymond, his eyes were red. He was looking straight at me. And I said, what happened? He said, then he turned around and then he moved. He said he was big, over seven feet. He said, big, like maybe three, four, 400 pounds like that. But he said when he moved, he said he moved fast. Went up the hill, he said. And uh, I said, oh. I asked Peter, and Peter said, yeah, he meant the same thing. I said, I said to Dwayne, how do you feel about that? To now as you, you look at it, you, you think about it. He said, and he surprised me. He said, just like his, he was back to eight years old again. He said, Raymond, that, that, that idea of looking at him still haunts me to this day. I'll start with this lady from Farrell. She's a Ross River Kaska Dany First Nation. And um, I forgot the year now. Uh, but a number of years ago, 2011 I believe, she gave me a call and she said, I would like to talk to you about Sasquatch. Yeah. So anyway, I went down to Johnson's Lake by uh, Farrell 
and I spent a couple of days with her, you know, she related to her experience. And her, here's what happened, her and her husband had a trap line on the south side of the Robert Campbell Highway, roughly around the um, Magundi River. Uh, they had quite a few traps and they may be making a living out of that. Uh, animal pelt and what have you. So anyway, uh, at one time in February of 2011, uh, her and her husband went out to check the traps, which they did on a couple of weeks, every couple of weeks or so. And when they arrived uh, along the, the Magandi River, and at one point there was a canyon uh, where the walls from mountain to mountains were probably uh, 20 meters across. So as they approach, all of a sudden there was noise, yelling, uh, and there were dead trees, a whole bunch of stuff being thrown at them. Basically, uh, and they could see Sasquatch on top of both hills, and obviously they didn't want them to get across there. For whatever reason, I don't know. She didn't know. Her husband didn't know. But obviously they were protecting their that piece of land. So they went they they, they turned around and went back to Pharaoh. Uh, and then they talked to their relatives and friends. They said, Well, that's a Sasquatch protecting that piece of land. They would not get across there. So anyway, as they went back, they took all the traps they could find out of there completely. And that was it for their trap line. Uh, another very interesting point on the Duncan Creek. Everybody knows where Duncan Creek is at? Think about Keno. It goes right through Keno all the way down to uh, the um, Mayo River, right? Today. So anyway, this fella, uh, he is a, or was, he died, he's died, he has, he has passed away. Uh, he um, was a hearing specialist and he was on contract with the Yukon Work Figures uh, Health Safety Board, Compensation Board. And his job during that summer was to visit different mine sites, especially a small mine site. And uh, he had an appointment in uh, Kino, Kino City, on top of the hill, actually, Kino Hill. But he was ahead of his schedule, so he took the, uh, from Mayo, he took the road on the right leading to Duncan Creek Road, and he parked around 6 o'clock at night, he parked around a uh, campsite or a, an old uh, quarry. Anyway, after dinner, he, uh, I should mention his vehicle was a three-ton truck with a hearing boot, test equipment, uh, a bedroom, and a kitchen facility. So anyway, he had dinner and decided to go for a walk. And he's a bit of a rock hon in that he, he looked for different type of rocks around. So he went by, by the Duncan Creek on a little trail. Coming back around the bend, he came face to face with two Sasquatch. A male, huge, and a female, pregnant. His word was she's ready to pop. <laughs> Again, this is his word, not mine. <laughs> so anyway, they both stopped, well, they, both of them stopped, so did uh, this fella. And then the female went directly behind the male Sasquatch, which is a, you know, quite a normal reaction uh, of so, sort of protection. And the Sasquatch had a, he said he had a grimace on his face. He was, you know, mad, but it didn't, there was no sound, no yelling, nothing. So this fella, uh, who's a First Nation fella actually from the New Islington by uh, Kitwanga. Anyway, he put his hand to his heart in this fashion and went out like this three times and the male faces changed completely. Basically, he was doing that as a sign of friendship. And then he pointed above, and he pointed to him, 
in West Pointing and basically uh, making hand movement that he would, he would go out of the trail to let them have the trail. So the boat Sasquatch calmed down. He started walking slowly. And then immediately the, the two Sasquatch walked a bit to their left and disappeared. Simply disappeared, just like that. Uh, as Raymond said, uh, many times people have seen it and for some reason they decide to become invisible. Uh, how? That'd be nice to know. The book, Nakgane, Tales of the Northern Sasquatch, is published by Dervile and Uproot Books.